It's good. <laughs> Hi, son. Thank you for having me back. It's good to be here. You know, I was here for 14 years, and no matter where I go, gun will always be in my heart. And it just... <laughs> you have a fantastic school, fantastic staff, caring people. I always like to say, take care of yourself and take care of each other. And I love you all, and I'm really happy to be back here. So I want to talk for a moment about numbers. For me, when I think about what is your number, there was a big one I hit this year. I hit the age of 50. Yeah. And it makes me think that from a statistical standpoint, I have fewer tomorrows than I do yesterdays. So you make think about make sure you live your life to the fullest. And I'm appreciative of everything I've been able to do in the past and what I'm able to do now. And I look forward to still living a long, full life. And, but I really want to cherish. And one of those things I want to share with you a little bit, the great things that are going to come up in your future that you're not even aware of yet. You know, I think of the, today's January 22nd. And it seems like yesterday, I can go back to January 22nd, 1983. I think it was a Sunday. I think the Super Bowl was being played, and I was watching the Super Bowl with my best friend, Mark Manuel and Blair Johnson. We're still friends today. It just, it seems like yesterday, and it's hard to believe how quickly that time goes by. But I think of all the great events, and I want you to appreciate not only the now, but look forward with an open mind in the future. First thing, what is your number? Oops. I'm a little rusty. I haven't been to Spangenberg for a while. All right. How many are juniors and seniors here? If I asked you your PSAT, SAT, ACT, or GPA, how many of you have that sort of memorized? Yeah. Because you feel like you're a bunch of numbers. And one of the things, you know, when I worked here and I was in charge of counseling, like the SAT, and in some ways it controls your life with the ACT. Like somebody would get a score of 2390 or an ACT score of 35. What would somebody say to them? Are you going to take it again? Why? Because you just missed me perfection. Because you're thinking, oh my gosh, if I get that perfect score, everything will open up. If I have that perfect GPA, everything will open up. Because what is the biggest thing that many of you are focusing on that's going to happen either next year, two years from now, three years from now? College. college. It just nonstop. Where am I going to go to college? Because when you get to college, your life will be amazing and incredible benefits will happen afterwards. How many of you have a dream school picked for college? You know, it's okay. Raise your hands. How many have a dream school? It's nice to see some hands don't. Some people don't have hands up. Because here's why. If you get into this dream school, your life will be perfect. You'll make friends for life. You'll have incredible business opportunities awaiting you. You'll meet your lifelong partner and have an amazing life together. How many of you feel that's true? Now, you guys are... But I asked this question a couple years ago, and everybody raised their hands. And here's the thing, I've asked your parents, how many of you, for your parents, owe 100% of the success of your life based on where you went to college? Hardly any hands go up. Because when you put your whole life in perspective, college plays a key role, but it's not the only role. I graduate from UC Davis. And it's a good school, by most measures. It, fits in the top 50 or whatever, US Newsweek, National Report, whatever. Did it make me who I was today? No. The events that happened maybe during then and more importantly afterwards shaped me more fully. I did have one significant event that did happen when I was in college that impacted me greatly. And I'm gonna show you a photo. It's very grainy, but there's a reason why I'm putting this photo up. That person in the background right there, is my father. And I was extremely close to my dad. My dad was a sports writer for over 30 years. He covered pro football from 1956 to 1987. He went to the first Super Bowl. And that's, I guess, significant a little bit in this area because in a couple of weeks, the Super Bowl will be played. Last week, I was watching a television show about the first Super Bowl, and they unearthed some film they had never shown before. And in that film, in the background of this one interview they were doing with who was the commissioner of the NFL, there were all these sports writers in the background, that was my father. Now my father passed away 28 years ago, 
I only can remember one other film, <laughs> sorry, one other film I've ever seen of my dad. And so for one minute, I was watching film of my father, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's my dad. I'm pretty sure it's my dad. And I watched it, and then, and then when he smiled, he was talking to somebody else, and he smiled, I'm like, oh my, that is my father. And I texted my two brothers, thanks to the wonderful world of direct TV and instant recording and all that, they recorded too, and we had a really good exchange with each other about great memories of my dad. Again, he passed away 20, almost 28 years ago this May. And I always like to say, and here's a number, I'd rather had 22 great years than 50 mediocre ones. He was a huge inspiration to me in many ways, and even though he's been gone for a long time, still lives with me. And he has impacted me as much, if not more so, than anything I ever learned in college. So when I was, that's me when I was younger, You'll see another slide and you'll think, oh my gosh, Mr. J had hair. Anyway, <laughs> when I graduated from college, I didn't quite know what to, I wanted to do. I was in my 20s and I thought, you know, at some point maybe I want to go to business school or whatever. I decided to go work with my brothers. I have two older brothers that I mentioned just a moment ago. And they own a couple of bicycle shops. And I worked in a bike shop. It was great. You know, I'm in my 20s. I'm bike riding all the time, top of Skyline, going all over the place. And I'm selling bikes. Met a few people I dated, um, went out with them for a long time. It was, it was good times. And a couple of them will ask me a very important question. They go, what are you going to do with your life? And I said, you know what? I'm pretty happy right now. I'm working at the bike shop. I'm in great shape. I'm dating you. Life's good. <laughs> then within a few weeks, both times they broke up with me. But oh well, that's another story for another time. But I knew this necessarily wasn't what I wanted to do my whole life. And I thought, you know what, I, I should go to business school. But there was actually something deep down I really wanted to do. There's something I wanted to do, but I didn't think I could. And I pushed it behind me. And I said, yeah, I got to go to business school. So I enrolled and got accepted at Santa Clara Business School. And at age 28, I went in. I was at a crossroads. I realized I had a life plan that was based on what I thought others thought I should do. Because everybody, hey, does an MBA sound pretty good? Yeah. Master of Business, why? Because what, what happens when you get an MBA? You get a good paying job, make a lot of money, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I went to business school, and I'll never forget by the second night in January of 94, I had this cold feeling come over my body. I'm thinking, oh my God. I have to go to night classes for the next four years, taking classes I have no interest in, doing something that's really not in my heart. I don't want to do this. And I realized getting an MBA was what I thought I needed to do to impress others, but not in my heart what I wanted to do. So 10 days in January dramatically changed my life. January 1994, I still remember it. So I'm in that one of the classes, it was a Tuesday. And I had a printer, I had to print out a paper for one of the night classes I was in. And the printer wasn't working. Now this is not the day of wireless technology. This is back, in, you guys remember back in the night? Oh wait, none of you. <laughs> How many of you were born in the 90s? About, yeah, a few. So yeah, okay, you remember 90, no. Yeah, we're, 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 I know right here with you guys, we're, we're ending at 97, so I know it. 1994, we didn't have wireless technology. We had to get a thing called a printer cable. Anybody see this? You know, when you ever go through in your, uh, you know, garage or all that, you see like those old original Macintoshes, and you think, oh my gosh, this is really valuable, and you find out they're worth 50 bucks. But anyway, and you're still holding on to them. We had these old printer cables. So I had to go to a store to get a printer cable. But I didn't tell you another part of the story. Around this time of January 1994, one of my best friends I was talking about, Mark uh, Manuel, he and I were looking for a place to live. We were going to go, you know, have our bachelor pad and all that. So. During this time in January, we were looking around. We couldn't find a place. So I went to go get this printer cable. And I went to the store. And some of you probably know the location now. It was called Computer Attic. It went out of business years ago. It's now a Ferrari dealership. It's right in Redwood City, right near the border of Atherton. So I go to that store. And while I'm there, before I walk in, I look behind. And I see this apartment complex. I'd never been on the street before. And I, and I grew up in Redwood City. And so I went in the store thinking, you know what, after I'm done getting this printer cable, I'm going to go take a look at that apartment complex. And I went around the block, and this was the apartment complex. Now, it looks pretty nice, doesn't it? It wasn't quite that nice then, but it was still pretty nice. And I'll never forget, 
I walked up the, the streets right here, and I walked up the patio, and I was right there, and I was overcome with a sense, uh, feeling a sense of, this is where I want to live. Don't know why it came over me, but it just did. This is where I want to live. So I talked to the manager, and they had two apartments available. One right here, overlooking the pool, and another one on the absolute other side, overlooking an alley. Well, I don't know about you, but when you're in your 20s, I want to overlook the pool. So I picked the one that overlooked the pool. I didn't know at the time a significant event would happen as far as who lived here. So hold the thought. So January 27, 1994, I withdraw from school. Oh, shoot. Gosh, I just, <laughs> you did not see that. All right. <laughs> Everybody turn away, so I'm still using the clicker. We're getting used to it. All right. I decided to withdraw from Santa Clara University. And I'll never forget the hardest part is when I went home, I went to go see my mom. Now, granted, as I told you, my father had passed away. And I told my mom I was going to drop out of college, uh, business school. And she cried. There's nothing worse than seeing your mother cry. But what I haven't told you and I hadn't told her yet, there was something else I really wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was teach. I really wanted to teach and also coach. But when I was your age, teaching jobs were impossible to get. In fact, in this whole area, schools were declining enrollment, teachers were being let go. In fact, when I was in high school, the average age of a teacher seemed to be somewhere between the age of 55 and deceased. Now, <laughs> That seemed old back then. It doesn't seem quite as old right now. But anyway, they just weren't hiring anybody. But in the early 90s, I had kept in touch with some people I knew at my former high school. And they said, we're going to be hiring like crazy. And so that night when I decided to withdraw from business school, it just something came over me saying, I want to teach. And so I told my mom I was dropping out of business school. She cried. And she goes, what are you, what are you going to do? I told her. I want, to, I, I want to be a teacher. And guess what she did then? She cried even more. <laughs> now she tells people those are tears of joy because she's so happy and all that, all that time. But at that time, she was like, oh, no, you're a teacher and all that. But in time, she really grew to appreciate because this is what I love to do, what I wanted to do. And again, this wasn't something that I knew necessarily when I was in high school fully or I knew when I was in college. So January 27th, 1994. January 30th, 1994, I move into the apartment. Now, the nice thing is I immediately met her, and it just, we fall in love and all that kind of stuff. Now, it actually took about a year and a half. We passed each other by in the hallway a lot of times. I was dating another person. She was dating another person. But I'll never forget the day when I had broken up, and we just talked, and there was connection. And that's my wonderful wife, Deborah, and my beautiful, wonderful stepdaughter, Courtney. And that's me with a full head of hair. I do miss those days. <clears throat> anyway. We met, and at this time, I decided to do what I really wanted to do. I went back to school for what I wanted, and I became a teacher. Greatest decision I ever made. This is the most wonderful job in the world. Are there ups and downs? Absolutely. But working with all of you, having the pleasure to work with students, shaping the futures, and helping educate and grow kids is fantastic. I have never regretted my decision. Being in front of the students each and every day is a joy. Of course, after a couple of years dating, got married, another addition, my son, who's a little older now, and my wife and I. And again, I, 10 years, 12 years ago, still had some hair. Last few years have been hard. But anyway, so <laughs> moved on. Current photo of us today looks a little bit more like everything but I look like now, of course. And the final part is this in closing. You are more than just a number. Where you go to college will play part of your life. It will play in a many times, sometimes an important role, but it won't be everything. Be open to the possibilities. Just look forward to the opportunities that come up. You do not need to have everything mapped out fully right now. It's an amazing world out there. And as I said, college will be part of it. But the years afterwards and the events that will happen will shape you in such a wonderful way you don't even fully realize yet. And just 
enjoy each other, enjoy everything. I want to thank everybody for welcoming me back. I love you guys. You've been a great group of students. And as I always say, take care of yourself. As I said earlier, take care of each other. So long. Bye.